So first of all, I was under the impression it was monkey gras. So it's, come on, come on. Show me your stuff, you get beads, you get beads. <laughs> Here we go, that's it. <laughs> I'll be up on the balcony looking out later. Um, thank you, James, a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a few things. But un unfortunately, I, uh, uh, I didn't understand what James meant. So I might not be quite on topic. Uh, wait a second, who? Who is that? That's James. He also said, asked if we would talk about beer. I don't know a lot about beer. Uh, beer is a black box to me. Uh, but they certainly know me. They do a great job of understanding their user and they've done a good job. But I do know this, after a night like we're going to have tonight, uh, that's what tomorrow looks like. And I wanted to start here because I actually have a side project where I am really kind of at, at small scale craft. About a year and a half ago, uh, a couple of other guys and I founded a company called Handsome Coffee Roasters, which is a single origin roasting operation. In, uh, based in Los Angeles, and it's a really cool company. Uh, if you guys are ever in Los Angeles, go by there. I think the experience that we've created is second to none. And I bring this up to say, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got the 1956 uh, Probat UG22, all of the great stuff. We've got the Master Roaster, uh, but this is something that we're still trying to figure out how to scale from a relatively small roasting operation that services about 60 or 70 establishments across the U.S. into something that's much bigger. And so, uh, here I am, uh, worried about scaling something much, much bigger than handsome coffee roasters. And I've been entrusted with trying to create a culture of design at truly one of the world's icons. You may not know these people. Uh, the guy at the top is a man named Elliot Noyes. Elliot Noyes was hired in 1956 by Thomas Watson Jr. to establish IBM as the vanguard of modernity. And Elliot Noyes assembled what at the time, from about 1955 to about 1975, was the greatest constellation of corporate design really ever known until Apple. And in the 60s, if you remember, IBM was known for that. At the lower right, Ray and Charles Eames, a lot of you may not know that the Eames spent the 1960s at IBM designing. People like Errol Saarinen were with them, uh, Paul Rand. In 1961, Elliot Noyes was credited with designing the Selectric Typewriter, which to me, other than maybe the Gutenberg Press, is the, is the only thing prior to the iPad that the moment you saw it, everything before it went out of your mind. It was the definition of the leap ahead. We've done a lot of other great designs. Aero Serena did the 1964 World's Fair exhibit. Still an iconic statement of design. But we're doing it today as well. Last year at Lincoln Center, we did our Think exhibit where we talked about the history of innovation and we talked about IBM's particular role in it. But from the beginning of time, what, were all, what are all of the inventions that have mattered? And even recently, we've won industrial design awards for things like our new Z Enterprise machine where we rethought heat transfer and baffles around those things. The point being that IBM has a history of design and an ethos of design, and in parts of the company, we're doing it well. Unfortunately, today, James made the statement that you didn't know that IBM even sold products. Let me tell you, we sell too many products. In our software group alone, we have over 3,000 products in our portfolio. It is absolutely unimaginable. <laughs> when I came to IBM three years ago, it's almost three years ago to the date that Lombardi was acquired, uh, I used to be a relatively constant blogger at Lombardi, and uh, needless to say, I took a few pot shots at some of the competitors, one of which was IBM. When we were acquired, this is a true story, when we were acquired, Obviously, the due diligence teams. Let me tell you, IBM has lawyers. Uh, uh, we do, we do. And uh, the lawyers went through everything, 
and I was asked to take down one blog post, and that's all. And there were several that were somewhat critical of IBM. But there was one that was particularly offensive. And we had just in, been involved in a sales cycle with a, with a client in, in Florida, and at the last minute, the IBM rep comes in and says, look, take our BPM stuff for free for a year, and just use it for a year for free. And then if you still don't want it, then go buy that Lombardi stuff. And so it froze that sale, and I wrote a blog post, and it was simply this. If you think IBM does BPM, they certainly do. I had a link to the web page, and it looked something like that. And I said, if you can make sense of that and do BPM, and you get it for free, it's worth every penny. <laughs> they asked me to take that blog post down. <laughs> a few months later, uh, one of the senior vice presidents asked me if I would take over this portfolio. And James's story is basically accurate. And over a period of 18 months, we worked very hard and changed a lot of the culture of a group of almost 1,000 people, a portfolio at the time that was doing about $350 million a year. And 18 months later, this is what we had. We combined capabilities where needed. Every one of those products, uh, well, one of those products is a SaaS product. You go online, you'll be, you'll be up and running in about five seconds. Uh, but the other two products now can be set up. All of the capabilities of the stuff on the left in about seven clicks, and you're up and running. <clears throat> uh, the point being that design doesn't start with just products. And knowing your users doesn't just start when they, after they've installed and after they've acquired. It starts well before that. It starts with understanding how to articulate values and how to understand a value prop as it manifests over the lifetime of the use of the product. And what we're finding at IBM, and what I think some of your all's companies are, are finding, uh, is that customers have to do too much integration and have to buy too many products to actually achieve the fulfillment of the value proposition that they want over a 10 or 20 year period. And so we're starting to rethink everything with that kind of time frame for every single product. Now at the same time, we're also applying a very different mental model around users and usability to the products themselves. And so now, three of those products you can see on the screen, we have common visual design languages. They're starting to look and feel alike. Their the the uh, user interaction model is beautiful. And uh, in the course of about two years, a $300 million portfolio organically grew to almost $600 million. The market and our users, our clients, and, and will reward us if we do great work. And so as a result of that, and as, as a result of Jenny coming on board about a year ago and really understanding the needs of the portfolio, we created IBM Design. And I was asked to run it and started uh, last August, and kind of the first thing I did was really really try to get to the root of creation. Uh, I can't dictate, for all of the reasons that the previous speakers talked about, all of the interconnections, all of the collaborations that have to occur, I can't dictate outcomes. I can't even dictate the conceptualization of that moment of creation. But I started looking at art. I collect American self-taught artists. And this is one of the iconic self-taught artists, a man named Sam Doyle. He rarely ventured off his island in St. Helena, South Carolina. He's been dead about 25 years. One day, a, uh, shortly after he was uh, put up at the Corcoran Museum in 1982, he was also at a, at a, shown at a gallery in Atlanta. And after his showing was over and all of his tens, which he just literally hung in his front yard, and how you get that composition and that moment of creation from a man who is painting with house paints on old tin is just beyond me. But tins like this one were in the back of this gallery in Atlanta, and another man was coming to hang his photos. This is Sam, and the other man in about 1978 that was walking through that gallery was Jean-Michel Basquiat. And Jean-Michel Basquiat was so inspired by Sam Doyle that it altered the entire trajectory of his art and his creation. I can't dictate those kinds of outcomes. I can't dictate it in a small team. 
We saw the example of the violin maker. We saw the example of a 200 person, actually a much smaller team that, that just redid the, the website for gov.uk. You can't dictate outcomes. People have tried to dictate outcomes. We've tried to do it at IBM. Microsoft tried to do it. They tried to say consistency is everything. There's nothing more consistent to the Windows experience than the original Windows smartphone. This came out two years before the one that actually won. You can't dictate outcomes. And so I started thinking about that. There's a story from the early 1960s where when they were getting ready to record their first album and the Beatles had their first meeting with George Martin. George Martin did the routine thing. He did the process-oriented thing. He was a known producer. This young, uh, emerging band was recording their first album. And what did he do? He ran the play. He brought in all of the songs written in Tin Pan Alley, and he said, here, we're going to do an album of covers. It's going to be great. George Martin trusted John and Paul, and they said, no. We'll do half covers. We're going to do half originals. The rest is history. The point being, as I think about what we're doing at IBM, it is not about process. And that might fool you. It's actually about not a new way of acting, but trying to instantiate a new way of thinking. And how do you enable a way of thinking at scale? It's the problem I started thinking about. And I came up with, and a couple of years ago actually, even in my startup days, I was talking about the things that I had learned in my career of startups and in trying to scale high-performing teams, and had come across three concepts that I'll share with you today, which is how I approach product development and building high-performance teams. The first of all, to the point made earlier, all of my developers cannot be rock stars. Maybe none of them are rock stars. But what we do need to make sure is that everybody is aligned around a clear set of conceptual models. I'm going to talk about those in just a second, and I'm going to get very specific about what I mean. But communicating conceptual models so that the entire collaborative community, all of those nodes on the network diagram, understand the goals and understand how we're going to collaborate is critical. The second thing that I understood is that it was about people, not process. Now, simply putting good people on the ground isn't good enough. And what I really have learned over my career is that it's about decisions, not process. And it's about facilitating great decisioning responsibility. You know, you've often heard in design that the whole point is to try to fail and fail fast. The only way you can do anything fast is if somebody is there actually deciding, actually owning the decision, and making that call, and letting the team move on. The third thing is a set of peer-reviewed artifacts. You know, one of the talks earlier today talked about the book club and the code reviews. Those are peer-reviewed artifacts. The issue is not to dictate the steps that you take in creation and the implementation of creation. The step is to make sure that we have a community, a trusting community of people that are respected among each other that are actually reviewing the outputs of those people. Not dictating how the outputs are obtained, but reviewing the outputs. You know, I actually heard uh, earlier, I think it was the Heroku uh, uh, talk uh, to about the multiple tools by developers. That doesn't scare me. This is a novel notion around IBM. We obviously are a company that in order to scale, many people think you have to dictate standards and dictate implementations and dictate process. I'm much more interested in dictating the oversight of the enablement of great thinking. I don't care what tools you use. We will agree on a few things, common design languages. We will agree on common interaction models. We will agree on certain great integration points so that our portfolio works together. But how you work, we need to leave that in a very distributed way. I started talking about this and about a year ago or maybe eight months ago, I was giving a talk to the uh, uh, Department of Defense in the U.S. and a gentleman came up who was a colonel uh, in the Marines and said, 
I've never heard anybody articulate a military concept in a civilian context before. And I kind of said, what are you talking about? And he talked to me about this notion of commander's intent. I started doing quite a bit of research on this and have now talked to several people in the, this is now taught at the Naval Academy as well as at West Point in the US. It was actually a concept invented by the British Army. And it is essentially a concept, the greatest line that I've heard about it, it is a framework for a freedom to act. And so as we communicate to our teams, the way that the military scales operations is not to dictate what happens once you actually enter a field of battle, but once you start encountering those unknown unknowns, which we do every day in software development, as we actually start to deliver a project, as long as we have a good mental model about the mission of the release, the goals of the release, then we will probably achieve those goals. But if we start dictating the tactics and the implementations, thou shalt use dojo, thou shalt do this, all of a sudden we lose the fox and our mental model is wrong. All right? The user is on top, reuse and implementation is in service of that user. Too many of us as developers and as companies get that model exactly wrong and we start looking for reuse and the user interaction is in service of reuse. Again, we can't dictate outcomes. We've got to prepare for great outcomes. And that's essentially what we're doing in IBM Design Thinking, which is our scalable approach to how we're doing this across all of IBM. And I'll share with you some of those details about very specifically how we're implementing those notions of clearly communicated mental models of how to behave and what to do, great decision making, and making sure that that is aligned and decisions are made in as distributed a fashion as possible uh, along the way. So here is, and now we're going kind to of, kind of get down the weeds a little bit, uh, here's actually the, the model and, and the, the lines are kind of washed out, but you can see that product management, design and engineering are all the, the main collaboration people inside of our collaboration model. You're going to see something that most uh, agile frameworks don't really stick right in the middle of it. We actually have the notion of sponsor, we call them sponsor clients, and the users at those clients actually participate from day one of a release in our release cycles from now on for the projects that are adopting IBM design thinking. This is about, in a given release, which may last, let's assume that we're releasing something in six or eight months, this is about 10 to 15 hours per week from one of our clients and a particular user that represents a set of user stories for one of the hills that we're trying to take in the release. This is a significant commitment on the part of our users. And by the way, this isn't just the runtime users, this is every kind of user. These are the DBAs, these are the networks ops people, these are the administrators, these are certainly the, de the developers if the, if the tooling involves uh, development. All of the user personas that we've identified that the product area touches, we actually recruit sponsor users uh, as, a, as, a, as a front end thing. Product management is asking questions like, how do I engage? The sponsor user is what's in it for me. The designer, how do I create great products and solutions? And obviously engineering is how do I do this with a minimum of waste? And so this collaboration model is one of these conceptual models that we really focus on. And I'm gonna walk you through kind of the high level aspects of it. First of all, at the very beginning is obviously project kickoff. We have a very unique thing for project kickoff that we call the three hills. I'm a big believer in the three and only three philosophy. And I think if you have a release that is tackling more than three high level value statements, it's too many. And how do you pare that down? So we actually do a lot of work on these hills and we call them the release hills. You'll, you'll see here that there's four. The fourth one is any given release can also have a set of serviceability or technical debt as a part of it. But three and only three hills are defined and at the outset, product management at a relatively high level, you know, kind of the, the owner of the portfolio is going to set the mission for a given release. During this initial phase, we start doing back of the envelope understandings and sizings with engineering of how these hills are going to be attained. Designers are actually starting to engage, we're starting to see sketches, we're starting to see wireframes, we're starting to have an understanding and communicate a shared understanding of exactly what it means to attain one of these hills. And we're also starting to, and this is really important, allocate the specific investment that we're gonna make in this release to attaining that hill. 
And these investments, by their nature, are thread safe unless there's an escalation back up to the top. How many times in releases do we get down toward the end and something that we're trying to do has an overrun and so we start hacking features from some other part of the product? And all of a sudden, all of the emphasis on users, all the emphasis on user stories, all of that stuff goes out the window because we've got to start hacking features because we've had a cost overrun in one part of the product. Having this investment model in place is probably one of the most fundamental changes to how we're doing business at IBM to ensure that the intention of the release is actually going to be achieved. At each level of these releases, you have owners, the people that actually own the hills. There's a design lead, an engineering lead, and a uh, product management lead for each one of the hills. For smaller products, they can actually be shared. You could actually have somebody that owned more than one, but their responsibilities are to at attain that hill. Now, what that actually means as we get into the release can alter, but uh, it's very important. So that's kind of what happens during this discover and envision phase. We do all of the typical design work, <clears throat> do the interaction model, heavy emphasis on sketching, working prototypes, feedback with the field, all culminating in a release blueprint. One of the other things that we do that's very different is we don't collaborate around the issue tracking system. The issue tracking system is a set of features and functions that have been decomposed from these user stories. And that's great for engineering. It's not great for product management, the designer, and the sponsor user. 100% of our collaboration, 100% of our triage is built around the release blueprint and the artifacts in that. That is the single source of truth and retraining engineering to truly think in user story fashion is very, very difficult. It's an example of some of the release blueprint. The main thing is there's a logical flow to it. Ultimately, it breaks down to all of the requirements, and this is actually cross-referenced back into the, uh, into the issue tracking system. We then move into the build and refine phase, and we move into what are called playbacks. The playbacks are an interesting part of the model because these are all actually user-led playbacks. This is the sponsor user. This isn't the engineering lead. It's not the product management lead. It's not the design lead. This is the end user lead that's actually going to show that his or her user stories are being solved by the product, and they're going to demo it. The interesting thing is not what happens in the playbacks, but I promise you if you actually force a user to demo an unreleased product, what's interesting is the set of collaborations that happen before the playback. It completely alters everything about that whole spirit of creation. We then go to the final playback and then release, and I'll just uh, touch on this briefly to say that this also works for products that are released very rapidly. What happens is, is that these hills and the discover and envision phase actually spans a series of releases, whether it's daily or weekly or monthly or whatever, and the build and refine phase goes on, and you actually stack these so that in, at any given time there is a ton of innovation and feedback happening. So. IBM design thinking and how we are scaling design at IBM is to really focus on these key building blocks, focus on the user. It is the number one priority, and it's all the users that a product touches or may touch. Define the release hills and make sure that they're very focused, make sure the entire team understands it. The impact on morale of every single engineer who actually knows that what they're working on is important is huge because too often we have too many people working on random stuff, and they don't actually understand how they are driving value for the company. The playbacks and the having user-led playbacks, obviously wiki-based release documents, and then finally I'll talk a little bit about metrics real quick. The metrics are all objective. There's, actually, there, there's no red, yellow, green. The quality is in the hands of the people and the craftsmen that are building the product. What I'm interested in is do they have owners defined? Do we have the decision-making apparatus in place? Have we allocated the investments and are we tracking against that investment model? And are the hills actually being attained? Talk, we're also doing quite a bit of recruiting into design. This is the pitch. The pitch isn't a product pitch, it's a human pitch. Any of you guys know designers? Please send us their CVs because we are actively recruiting and, we're putting together, and we have put together what I think is one of the most innovative onboarding processes in the industry. It's both for onboarding new candidates as well as uh, our existing IBMers. Uh, we, there was a, notion, a talk about boot camp today. We are running all of the internal IBMers, uh, cross-functional product manager leads, engineering leads, as well as design leads through our design camp 
For college hires, this is a three-month design camp, heavy emphasis on culture and social engagement. When our college hires graduate from design camp, they are immediately productive and immediately lead hills and responsibilities. It's very immersive, and uh, we do it for our college hires, for our professional hires, as well as internal IBMers, and most importantly, it's really fun. Um, I've talked about a lot. In closing, I just want to say we are rethinking everything at IBM. Our portfolio is a mess today, and it needs to get better. We're starting to envision our portfolio as something that is very holistic, and our mantra around each of our products in our portfolio is that they have to work together, they have to work the same, we have to have a common design language, interaction models, and finally, most importantly, they have to work for me. We are moving away from delivering products with an enterprise value proposition into a model where we deliver products that have personal value propositions for every single user that comes in contact with them. I'm one person, we are one group. I've got to deal with about 430,000 before I'm done. At the end of the day, while IBM design thinking is a particular approach, this is a culture statement. We are trying to change a culture at IBM, and I think if we do, we will have an impact on the entire world of design and product delivery. A while back, somebody said a strict observance of the written laws is doubtless one of the high duties of a good citizen, but it is not the highest. The laws of necessity, of self-preservation, of saving our country when in danger, are of higher obligation. To lose our country by a scrupulous adherence to written law would be to lose the law itself. With life, liberty, property, and all those who are enjoying them with us, thus absurdly sacrificing the end to the means. How do you scale craft? You enable people to think. And that's what we're doing at IBM Design. Thank you very much. <laughs>